Same thing for Google Hangouts back in the day. Yeah. Uh, okay. We should be live. Um, okay. So I, I did like literally the nerdiest thing I think I've done in a long time, which was I went through – uh, there's a service online that I really like called Just Watch. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It lets you, it tells you which show is where. So if you're like, oh, I want to see Star Wars, and you you can search for that, and it'll tell you, oh, you can see Star Wars on this on on Disney Plus and on Netflix or something, right? And then here's yeah. the places you can buy it. So um, I went through every service that is available and made a wish list of all the stuff that I'd like to see because Carl and I watch all kinds of weird, obscure movies. Like we're up for any, yeah. any show, right? We're not, we don't like, we don't get that excited about what like the big tentpole stuff are, but we'll watch, yeah. you know, fun, obscure sci-fi shows from Czechoslovakia and, and things like that. And so I, I put together this list and so I don't know if, if you're getting if you're getting this feeling, but there's just like this rising tide of services to subscribe for. Yeah. Right. It's overwhelming. Yeah, totally. So you're like, you've got Netflix and you've got Amazon and you've got um, YouTube. I've got YouTube premium and I just, you know, we subscribe for Disney plus because obviously baby Yoda and, <laughs> you know, it goes on and on. And yeah. And so I went through this process and it turns out that there is, there's like plenty of shows to watch on each one of the services. And so yeah. in fact, what it, what it makes the most sense to do is subscribe one to each. one and unsubscribe yeah. from all the others. And then the next month move over to the, to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's it's really interesting. Like I don't know if I have the guts to do it because then I'll be like cut off from the you know from the I don't know from the zeitgeist. But still, like well, and and this is where both Apple TV and Disney Plus are getting super clever and doing what HBO had always done, which yeah. is releasing one episode a week. Yes. So, uh, the the Apple show, uh, C with Jason Momoa, I. Uh, has a really confusing premise, but is done so well that I am completely hooked to it. If you haven't watched it and you have Apple people, uh, go watch this show. It's it's yeah, just captivating. Um, and because they release an episode every Friday, you have the choice of either waiting until the whole season is out, mm -hmm. which is what I did with American Gods. Or uh, you have to get one every single, or yes. you just stay subscribed. And they're going to keep you all the right. Weeks. And they're going to want to yeah. keep you subscribed for multiple months. So right now, in fact, Apple Plus is the worst value because they've only got a couple of shows and they're still coming out. You should wait right. for a year, and then you subscribe to to Apple Plus for a month. I I got the one free month. Yeah, so. yeah. Watch the show, and then yeah. and then cut the cut the service again and move on to the next one. And exactly. and the one that actually gives the best value, I mean, if you're into it, like, if you're w willing to watch like, like really well, like good movies, Oscar winning movies, etc. Cr the Criterion Collection is probably the best. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's like thirteen. Isn't that part of uh, Hulu? It used to be. No, I don't know who who runs it, but there's like just for me, there's a list of thirteen hundred movies that I could watch on this on this channel. So I'll be busy for years if if I wanted to, um, but I but I think what I'm going to do is is I'm just going to subscribe. I'm going to cut Netflix. Sorry, Chloe. I'm going to cut Netflix. <laughs> Sorry, kids. Um, and Disney Plus, and just go with one. And then when I feel like we sort of, you know, when we're getting a little sick of what Amazon Prime Video has to offer, then we're going to switch. But I feel like. There's just there's too many. Everybody wants to have your five ninety nine a month and fifty ninety nine yeah. a month, and yeah, it's rough. So, it's true. Yep, and that's just the pain of having to to rotate. But I am going to keep my HBO now simply because it turns out that the content that that I am most addicted to that comes out regularly is on HBO. So hmm. it's HBO plus one or plus two yeah well yeah, and you can usually... do the same thing show up once a year watch all your hbo stuff and then shut it off the next and then come back a year later 
except for like but, last week tonight and things, right? Like stuff that, right? Yeah. So. Yep. And like uh, people are mentioning, right? The expansion is going to be on Amazon. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I. Anyway, this is madness, and we're going to need to solve it. And so the way I think I'm going to solve it is, is everything's fired. It's all fired, and I just start from scratch again, and just go from there. I'll let you know how it works. Okay. Uh, hey, if you're wondering what it is that you've stumbled into, this is going to be an episode of Astronomy Cast. I'm Fraser. That's Pamela. And we are going to record this show live for you today. What's going to happen? We have no idea. It's all done live, randomly. We don't know. Um, now, this is going to be a two-parter. So we're going to, <laughs> Gordon says, <laughs> missing app box, uh, all these streaming services. Um, so we're going to record this episode. And then when we're done at some random period of time, we are going to shut this stream down and we will start up the next stream. So we're going to record episode. And those of you on Twitch can just stay put because you're fine. You're, you're all right, Twitch. You're okay. <laughs> Um, we're going to record 550 and then we're going to record 551, uh, for today. And what are you doing? Are you traveling? What's the plan? So, I, uh, Susie, Annie, and I, I scheduled a week in Florida to attempt to watch CRS 19, which was scheduled to launch on Monday. And then they rescheduled the launch to be earlier. So we planned an entire week and now we're praying for delays. So CRS 19, can you wait till Sunday to launch? It would make us happy. I realized uh, that actually this works for me too. Out hotel points. Yeah, this worked actually well for me because I'm going to be traveling next Friday. So And then you're gone the following yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be in I'll be in the San Francisco area. And next week is my birthday, so I'm going to get to spend it in Florida with friends. Excellent. Uh, all right. Well, so are you ready-ish? Yes. Ish? Yeah, ish is the correct word. This is episode what? 550. I am hopeless. I admit to this. The numbers are too large now. That's, we can't, we can't be responsible for remembering what episode we're doing. I'm ready to record. I'm ready as well. I'm recording. I'm also recording. Excellent. Okay. Here we go. Oh, that's the wrong one. That's the right one. Okay. Astronomy cast episode 550 messing miss messing. <laughs> Round two. Astronomy Cast, episode 550, Missing Epochs, Observing the Cosmic Dark Ages. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Fraser. How are you doing? Good. I hope you had a festive and fun Thanksgiving time with uh, all your friends and or family. It, I I did Friendsgiving. Yep. I, I was with some good friends of the show, David Joseph Wesley, who did our theme music. Uh, I crashed at his house with a bunch of other friends. And oh my goodness, we ate way too much. <laughs> but we also arted a lot. So you can now find my art up on oh, Society6. So society com slash star strider, go get yourself a planet. Uh, I still recommend, uh, you know, our version of this is, is cakes, cakes giving. So we just make cake. I, I like that. Yeah, idea. we just make cake. And so I'm trying to figure out how to turn Christmas into just pie. Pies, Miss. Mm. Ruxandra, whose last name I'm not going to destroy, uh, one of the friends of our show, she for her Friendsgiving, I uh, made a round meatloaf that had layered mashed potatoes and a parsnip puree, bright purple frosting. And then she used other fruits and not fruits, other vegetables. Well, tomatoes are a fruit as, as garnish. And it looked like a cake cake. Like a shepherd's cake. Savory. Yeah. Shepherd's cake. 
yeah and that's awesome this this is a thing that i i strongly um for your cakes giving and perhaps for christmas recommend yeah Powerful observatories like Hubble and the Very Large Telescope have pushed our vision billions of light years into the universe, allowing us to see further and further back in time. But there are regions which we still haven't seen, the cosmic dark ages. What is it going to take to observe some of these earliest moments in the universe? Uh, are we about to have a conversation about the James Webb Space Telescope? Maybe just like no. a little bit, just a tiny, just a no, no. All right, fine. <laughs> Wait, it's gonna happen uh all right so the uh, i'm trying to think of sort of how to set this up for people so i mean i guess the, when we look i mean obviously we're here in the galaxy we look around we see the stars we can see other galaxies a couple with our unaided eye well, like one with our unaided eye maybe two um with powerful telescopes we can see many but as we go farther and farther the view just gets dimmer and more red shifted and there's less and less that we can see. So how far back and how far away, and I know this is sort of like two different things, can we see right now? Answering that with numbers would require me to know the Hubble constant. Yeah. And we recently did a show that explains why I don't know the Hubble constant. What yes, I can nobody does. tell you. Yeah is we can see the cosmic microwave background radiation, which we believe was released 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So there's this one epic wall of light that we see in all different directions. And then we start to see things that cropped up a few million years after the Big Bang. And there's this gap between the release of that cosmic microwave background and that, well, so there's two gaps. There's the Big Bang, and then 400,000 years later, cosmic microwave background was formed. Haven't seen anything within that first right. mysterious epoch. And that'll then be the a, topic for next week's episode, is that, that first part that we can't see, the time when the entire universe was like the interior of a star. <laughs> it's so hard to see. And, and then we had a second epoch between when the cosmic microwave background was released and when the universe lit up with stars and galaxies and we're just starting to be able to get hints of those early days of the universe during a period that we refer to as the epoch of reionization or epoch of reionization. I don't care. It's that time at which the universe again became transparent. So, I mean, I'm going to need a more specific understanding. So, I mean, we've got the Big Bang, whole universe is, you know, very dense. It's getting less dense over time, it's cooling down, eventually it cools down to the point that it becomes transparent that light can finally escape and this and we see this as the cosmic microwave background radiation and, and and the universe was red at that point. Yes. Um, and then but but that's just like all of these photons of light that are left over from the universe being this hot star. And then you've got all of this hydrogen and helium gas, and it is warm, because it was kind of like the Big Bang, you know, cooling off from the Big Bang, able to give off this light. And so then it kept cooling down. So so let, let's unpack this. Yeah, one. yeah. I mean, there's like a bunch of little phases in this sort of idea right. of reionization and everything lit up again. So yeah, like take us very carefully from like, Everyone understands cosmic microwave background. Let's move forward from there to okay. what to what we can see again, so we can understand that missing part. So, so in the moment before the release of the cosmic microwave background, the universe was this hodgepodge of ato atomic nuclei, of electrons, and of photons. So we had light. We had nuclei and we had electrons. The universe was ionized. Then that next moment, the electrons glommed onto the nuclei. And when this happened, 
suddenly there were fewer things for all of that light to be interacting with. And light was able to go from the tiniest of distances that was able to travel between before being absorbed and re-emitted to being able to just keep going until it made it all the way to our detectors. Yeah. So in that moment, the universe became a mash of neutral atoms and all the photons that had been previously generated were set free. Now, there weren't new photons being generated at this point in time because the universe is just like hydrogen, helium, trace amounts of lithium and beryllium sitting there going, hi, we're atoms, mostly. This is where we start to get interesting things like the 21 centimeter hydrogen forbidden light. And it wasn't exactly lighting up the whole darn universe, but it was there occasionally giving off a photon here, a photon there. And in addition to that, we also have a universe that isn't completely smooth. There are places that have higher densities and there are places that have lower densities. And that meant that we had an unequal pull of gravity. And so these higher density regions were able to pull material into them. Eventually, with some of that material forming, high enough densities that nuclear reactions ignited in the cores of the first giant stars. We're talking stars 30 times the mass of the sun to 300 times the mass of the sun. To tens of thousands of times the mass of the sun, maybe. Uh, I said maybe. I'm going to go with hundreds. Yeah, yeah. I'm more comfortable going with hundreds of times the mass of the sun. But uh, when this occurred, the the light coming off of these incredibly hot stars ultraviolet light in a lot of cases that energy is capable of ionizing all of that hydrogen gas and taking it from being neutral to being again free electrons and free nuclei but now the universe is a whole lot larger it's also a whole lot cooler so unlike before for the release of the cosmic microwave background when it was a bad thing to have an ionized universe. The universe has now expanded and cooled and expanded and cooled and expanded and cooled to the point that when we reionize it, all we're doing is making it possible for the light from newly forming galaxies to spread out and be seen. And so it's a good thing to realize. The right. So let me just make sure I've got this straight. So you've got the cosmic microwave background. And so all this light has been bound up, bouncing around inside from atom to atom. And finally, it cools down to the point that this light can just escape. And then the universe goes dark again after that first yeah. flash of light goes past everything. And the universe yeah. goes dark again, and it's all of this hydrogen and helium. And then this stuff collects into stars, the first monster stars. Those stars give off radiation, and that radiation re-ionizes, re-illuminates um, uh, the clouds of, of hydrogen gas that were everywhere, creating a time that you can see again. And, and the first stars probably weren't alone in doing uh, this illumination, this reionization of the universe. We also had at the same time in the most massive galaxies, turbulent inflow of material that formed supermassive black holes, as well as the accretion disks around those black holes. And accretion disks, if they're big enough, if they're dense enough, if they're hot enough, can ignite and also give off light. When we're looking at quasars, when we're looking at active galaxies, that bright central core, that's not the black hole. Black holes don't give off light people. That's the accretion right. that's giving off all that light. And so the, the part that that is the dark ages then is that time from after the cosmic microwave back home was released to before the light from all those first stars started to light up all of the clouds of gas and dust that was the or so gas that was the ages. that's the dark ages that's the dark ages right. and then it takes time for those first stars and first galaxies to ionize the entirety of the universe right so you have this period of reionization and we don't know exactly how long it lasts 
during which these first sources of ionizing radiation, bright light, are turning on. And they initially, each star ionizes the bubble around it. And then the bubbles start to overlap. And all of this pushes outward, illuminates outward, and clears up our universe. And exactly how that happens, we've got computer models, but seeing it is something we're just on the edge of potentially being able to do. Okay, so what's it going to take to be able to see that then? Well, if we want to see the 21 centimeter radiation, we need telescopes that can see at some of the longest wavelengths of light. 21 centimeter light in our local galaxy requires a radio telescope. And we're now looking at light that is redshifted from the beginning almost of the universe into the modern day. Um, we're looking at like two meter, two meter long rate radiation, according to one paper I was looking at. Right. So this, this is like the same thing where say the cosmic microwave background today is microwave several millimeters long. The originally it was red light and it's over the expansion of the universe that has been stretched out to be this this size. And so this 21 centimeter, this this hydrogen uh, radiation that was being emitted at originally at 21 centimeters is now meters across. And to have right. a radio telescope that is capable of, of detecting that at that level of sensitivity is a is a pretty hard, it's a pretty hard job. And, and this is where uh, looking at telescopes like LOFAR, which is being built in Northern Europe, looking at the Future Square Kilometer Array, these massive new radio arrays that have, in some cases, quite large dishes as well, this is how we're going. It's not necessarily large dishes. Let me rephrase that that have antennas sensitive to the longer wavelengths of light. You start building your antennas fundamentally differently. They're not just big dishes anymore. When you start looking at things that are this long a wavelength, um, they start looking more like spiky bits coming up out of a field. Right. So when you start build, building larger spiky bits rising up out of a field, uh, this is going to allow us to be sensitive to the extraordinarily faint because 21 centimeter radiation, this is generated by the spin flip within a hydrogen atom. There, there's different states for the alignments of the particles within the neutral hydrogen. And when you change that alignment, that's what gives off the 21 centimeter radiation. This isn't an electron bouncing between layers. This is simply the atom going, huh, this other state might be a little more stable. I'll flip. And right. it's very rare. It's very temperature dependent. It only occurs in low density environments where you don't have collisions taking place. In order to see that, we need massive arrays with huge collecting area. And we need sensitivity to this really long wavelength. And it, I well, mean, we this, this 21 centimeter is great because it's just it shows you where all the gas is. And I'm you know, yeah. where all the repositories of, of future star forming gas is located around the universe, no matter how cold it is, it emits this very specific kind of, of radiation. And if you can see it, you can map out where all that stuff is. So so then you know, we've kind of identified this time and it's the first what few million years after the cosmic microwave background was emitted. Right. What, I guess, what do astronomers want to know about that time? And how could that then help them un better understand the universe? Well, it, it gets down to constraining factors. We, we have ideas, we always have ideas. We have these simulations theories about Yeah, we have lots of models, simulations. 
uh, that that describe okay so this is how the universe started this is the age of inflation this is the cmb then we have gas and and then we start to form galaxies in two different ways through little tiny things building up and merging and through giant things turbulently and falling stars turn on we don't understand these stars at all these stars reanize the universe so we can at least see the swiss cheese of the universe having bubbles of ionized material getting blown up with the 21 centimeter line the next thing that we want to look at and this is where your jwst hint came in the other thing is the first stars that turned on would have been giving off massive amounts of light specifically in the ultraviolet and that ultraviolet light gets red shifted into the infrared which is where we start to see the use of the JWST when and if it ever launches. Yeah, it'll launch. It'll launch. I I don't count my telescopes till they're functional. I know, we know, I know. this. Um, and it has the potential to begin to see the ultraviolet light of these early stars in its red shifted into the infrared form starting to resolve the earliest galaxies. It's not going to end up it's not going to resolve individual stars right but we can start to put together patterns of this is how hot the stars appear by looking at these galaxies and figuring out what kinds of spectral energy distributions what kinds of distributions of light coming off of different numbers and different temperatures of stars are necessary to reproduce the light we see coming from these earliest galaxies and that's kind of what we're hoping to do to map out the still neutral hydrogen gas by tuning our 21 centimeter detections to ever increasing redshifts and by looking for those first stars by looking in the infrared and seeing what their added up light looks like and how we can match it with our models um i again i know for you, James Webb doesn't exist, but for me, <laughs> um, uh, one of the, so a couple of the cool things about James Webb is like the Hubble Space Telescope right now, when they use a gravitational lens, like normally Hubble can see out about 5 billion, the light from galaxies that are about 5 billion light years away, if it really tries, um, but can go a lot farther than that when they did their, say their, their Hubble ultra deep field survey and they were able to see to you know just a few hundred million years after the big bang and when they want to be able to when the the galaxies line up perfectly then they can see with gravitational lensing they can see some galaxy that's maybe only 500 million years after the big bang james webb will be able to see those anywhere it wants in any direction at any time. Just like, do you want to see galaxies over there that are 500 million years after the Big Bang? No problem. But also... You may have to wait for the Earth and the James Webb to to orbit yeah. to where it needs to be to not like have to look through the sun. But yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just, yeah look at the stuff in the, in the hemisphere <laughs> of the sky that you want to today. Um, but then also you're going to get, um, when it does its deep field, with 100 hours of collecting for each of its filters, then it's going to be able to go all the way to 250 million years after the Big Bang, which is farther back than anything is, has been able to see. So we're going to get the James Webb version of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And, and that is just an, a mind bending amount of capability. And yet, as you sort of said earlier, that's not good enough. That's not enough yeah. to see those first stars. That's enough to see those first galaxies but you still can't see those first stars. And, and this is where we have to remember that even with the Cepheid Key Project to measure the distances to as many of the nearby galaxies as possible using Cepheid pulsating variable stars, that was not able to see much beyond our local group. We are constrained in what we're able to see and an eight mil eight millimeter an eight meter dish isn't going to get us individual stars at the beginning of the universe kinds of resolutions i haven't done the math but my gut tells me a solar system sized telescope still wouldn't get us 
the needed angular resolution to see individual stars at the beginning of the universe. Um, this is where luckily by spending so much of our scientific history crippled by tiny telescopes, we've gotten really good at figuring out what's going on in galaxies by only being able to look at their cumulative light by sticking an aperture on that whole darn thing and summing it up and figuring out what stars must be there. And this is what we're going to have to do to figure out the early universe. So now have you looked into the, um, the Murchison Widefield Array? Is this one of the observatories that you were going to talk about? No, that, that one's still new. Yeah. Um, low f yeah. You, you know the future things better than I do. Yeah. So, so for those of you who are new and don't understand why I'm so reticent to discuss things that don't yet exist, LOFAR exists. It's just getting upgraded. SKA will exist. It's on the ground. It has precursor projects. I, when I was working on my dissertation, I had an X-ray satellite I needed not exist the way it was supposed to. After launch, there was an engine failure. And the big telescope I was supposed to use, the Hobby Eberly, uh, didn't actually start to fully function until many years after my dissertation was complete. So I ended up using the historic McDonald Observatory telescopes, which while fine, meant that I only did a fine dissertation and I remain bitter. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, uh, it's farther along than you might think. The, the Murchison Wyfield Array is in Australia. Um, and it consists, and this is like those spiky things you were talking about. It consists of uh, the original one is 2048 radio antennas arranged into 128 tiles. And it was built in 2013. And then the number was doubled to 256. And the goal, as we talked about earlier, is to look for that neutral hydrogen. And then all of that data, all those data is fed into a supercomputer, and then they are crunching the information. And now they have just done a paper just in the last couple of weeks about what they've been able to find. And it looks like, and this is going back to what you said, which is that there is a, you can't, you can't resolve the individual stars, but you can see the collective radiation that is coming from all of them all at the same time. And in this case, they're looking for this collective signal from the neutral hydrogen that was being released during that period during the dark ages. And so they're getting a lot closer. And what I'm really enjoying is watching the white papers for the 2020 decadal survey starting to come out, where we're seeing people say, we need to pay attention to these longer radiation wavelengths. We need to start thinking about how do we use the 20 centimeter line to explore the earliest parts of the universe. People are starting to get tired of waiting to get more infrared on orbit and saying, let's figure out how to do this from the ground. And it's really amazing to see all the science that people are figuring out new ways to do, whether it be through looking more closely at gravita gravitationally lensed distant galaxies, whether it be by looking in new pockets of the spectrum that makes it through the atmosphere, or just considering building telescopes, well, on the backside of the moon. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, did you know that there is now an operational radio telescope on the far side of the moon? China has one. Yeah, it? it's a space-based telescope. Um, but it is in the shadow of the of the moon is able to observe from from that position. It's it's a bit tinier than I think. <laughs> yeah, people it's are a, thinking. yeah, I think a lot of people really want to go and take one of these big old craters, buff out the boulders and other bits and turn it into a radio dish. And one of the really cool things is uh, there's some research I saw a few years ago coming out of Tennessee. I don't remember if it was University of Tennessee or Tennessee State, where the composition of standard lunar regolith is such that if you nuke it with microwaves, I'm talking like microwave oven nuking it, like yep. we talk about with food, not like nuclear bombs, bad use of language on my part. If you microwave it, it will solidify. So you can take regolith powder, shape it into whatever you want, hit it with the right color of, of light, and now you have a solid. 
And this gets talked about in terms of this is a great way to make roads. This is a great way to smooth out areas, make landing pads. It's also a great way to, well, make the support structure that we build a radio dish onto. But uh, considering the fact that it's, say, $50,000 per pound to put something onto the moon compared to uh, walking over and just building it here on Earth, I, I know, but you, instead of having like von Neumann probes, can I just have lunar von Neumann robots sure. that just build things on the moon instead of putting people there? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I just want like lunar factories for building telescopes and stuff. So next week we're going to talk about the, uh, the that other uh, period of dark ages uh, right after the Big Bang, which is also very difficult to study, but there may be some ideas. So uh, Pamela, do you have some names for us this week? I do. And as always, Susie is going to have to cut out the moment while I find the correct window to be in. Ah, it's here. It's just in the wrong part of my screen and it's open to the wrong page. And I love all of you and hate myself. Such self-loathing. There. Oh, I'm logged into the wrong account. Ah, I opened Patreon. I didn't notice who I was logged in as. So if you would like to support Fraser, Universe Today on Patreon is a great place to go. If you would like to support my artwork, Star Strider on Patreon is a great place to go. And this show is supported through Astronomy Cast on Patreon. All right. So um, here are the names for this week. I would like to thank for their patronage, Robert Johnson, Jason Kusturat, Jordan Young, Burry Gowan, Ramji Anmantu, Andrew Palestra, Brian K uh, Kaggle, David Troig, The Giant Nothing, Chauncey Wilson, Laura Kittleson, Robert Palasma, Jay Kidd, Corey DeVole, Les Howard, Joss Cunningham, Paul Jarman, Emily Patterson, and Warp Factor 9. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next week. Make this possible. Bye-bye. All right. Stop. And now we Save. Stop. Susie, thank you for being able to fix it when I accidentally talk over Fraser because I am apparently an asshole today. It's her, she loves to edit. I it can challenge, still be grateful. It challenges She's her. So she, good. she loves to be pushed to the limits to hack away the. <laughs> yeah. In fact, we should just figure out ways to make it harder to really help her raise her game to the next level. I like Susie. <laughs> We're doing this for her. Shut that down. I will not upload. And now I'm going to shut this whole stream down, and then we're going to show up at the next uh, next point. On YouTube. Twitch people, we love you. Yeah. Stay put. Yeah, Twitch people, you're set. Don't go anywhere. Um, we'll see you at the new channel in just a moment. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. There's the button.